Good morning. Good morning. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Most loving and merciful God, for our sake, you gave your beloved Son as a sacrifice for the whole world and to show us the way to live in your likeness. Give us grace to receive with thanksgiving the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow each day in his steps through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Even now, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So I ask, have they stumbled so as to fall? By no means. But through their stumbling, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their stumbling means riches for the world, and if their defeat means riches for Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I am speaking to you Gentiles, so do not become proud, but stand in awe. I want you to understand this mystery. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be restored as messengers, as it is written by the prophet Isaiah. Out of Zion will come the deliverer. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may receive mercy. 
For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. And to him be the glory forever. Amen. We'll say our psalm in unison. Oh, how great, good, and pleasant it is when brethren live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head that runs down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, and runs down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has ordained the blessing, life forevermore. the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. When the disciples approached and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees took, it, took offense when they heard you say that? He answered them, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into the pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes in, out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Then Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Grace to you and peace. Please be seated. Our psalm this morning, uh, Psalm 133. Good morning, by the way. <laughs> um, our psalm this morning, 133, um, it, it falls in. I don't know if you've ever read through all the psalms. Uh, in, in the psalms, there's a lot uh, about being righteous and God standing on the side of the righteous and God standing in the face of those 
who are who the rich those rich folks who oppress others and become even more rich and wealthy upon others back it's about exploitation um, against over and against righteousness this is this is where God is going um, with with the talk in many of the other Psalms this is about creating the beloved community this is about God's vision for the world oh how pleasant it is when brethren live together in unity sound like something we need to hear well, events of the last couple of weeks and the comments about those events um, have been stirring in all of our minds. Uh, they have created within us, I think, a certain chaotic um, chaos, internal chaos. Um, it, this, is, this is in a world that um, up until a little while ago, it seems, we, we had become um, a, sa- a place of safety. Um, and, and now it things, seems that things are not quite as, as we thought they were. And it also means that our responses as um, human beings, and particularly as Christians, are not as we thought they were supposed to be. I love what um, former heavyweight champion of the world Mike Tyson once said, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. I think we've been punched in the face. And now um, is not the time to forget what the plan is, that plan being uh, the vision of the beloved community, which is what our commitment is here. In um, Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, something is continuing to go on here. Um, Paul is continuing in chapter 11 to defend his Jewish brothers and sisters. He's been defending them now for three Sundays in a row. He's been trying to keep the Gentiles and the Jews locked together in unity by saying that nobody has any right to boast. And those of you who think that there are Jews who don't follow Jesus have lost your mind because that's not right. There are all kinds of followers of Jesus. And you Gentiles, don't you forget that the Jewish folks were the chosen people of God. So here we have a chosen people, chosen to be the light of the world, coming into the world to let the Gentiles, those non-Jews, let them know that there is such a thing as the love of God and that is for all people. All of us lose our way sometimes, and all of us forget what our call is and to whom we are to bring the message, the message particularly in this instance of hope and love. Um, Paul is saying, yes, we've all forgotten. We all have lost our our way, the Jews, the Gentiles, the Christians, the non-Christians, the Presbyterians and the Baptists and the Catholics. And Lutherans and the Mormons and the Church of Christ and even the Episcopalians. In our um, in an address this past week, um, our presiding bishop Michael Curry um, said something very interesting. He said he mentioned a book written back in uh, the 60s, 1967, by Martin Luther King called "Where Do We Go From Here? Will We Choose Chaos or Community?" He also said towards the end of that. Um, that times of crisis, moments of crisis are times for decision. I think it's fair to say that we are in a moment of crisis. I also think it's fair to say that as Christians, we are here to decide. In fact, our being here is the decision already made. Now, I am not one typically to stand up before you and tell you what is right and what is wrong. I typically leave that for God and you to figure out. I try to speak into that place between you and your relationship with God and to let God's transforming love be a part of your life without me driving it down your throat. I believe and trust in conversion by Jesus Christ, by the love of God. I do not feel as though it is my place to to feed that to you, only to be with you while we both eat. But there is such a thing as right and wrong. And we are in a moment in our life where there is wrong and we must choose right. Supremacy of any kind is incompatible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. White supremacy is not compatible with the gospel of Jesus Christ and is incompatible with the way 
that we are to follow. I heard an interesting comment by a hip-hop artist this past week. He said, um, white supremacy is not a shark. He said, white supremacy is the water. And then he said, one person, less than one person a year dies from a shark attack in the United States. Thousands drowned. The point being that what we think we know as a small, small uprising of supremacy actually is bigger than we ever thought it was. And those of us who thought we had left that far behind us, say 40 years ago or so, uh, know for a fact that we have not. So I think our presiding bishop is right. Now is the time when we assert ourselves against all that is wrong. Now, I don't want to get into a judgmental battle about all the things that are wrong and all the things that may be right, but there are some times when it's crystal clear, and this is one of those times. I remember, um, I don't remember, because I wasn't born yet, but I've seen it a couple of times, uh, a, a radio and uh, televised address by um, uh, John F. Kennedy back in 1963 uh, when addressing the nation uh, on uh, discrimination, racial discrimination. He said, uh, those of us who fail to act are inviting shame and also violence. We don't want to be a part of that. We don't want our silence as things go into chaos to be perceived in any way as us not standing completely and totally against all suppression. There is a certain moment when the gospel becomes apparent and it oftentimes seems that the gospel only becomes apparent when there is something that's, that is so anathema to it that we cannot help but be pushed up against the gospel and wonder whether or not this is the time for us to truly live as Christians. Time for us to choose between the right and the wrong and the truth of the way of Jesus Christ. And, and nobody, I'm not saying anything you folks don't already know. But I wonder, as I watched video from last week's um, conflict, is a small word, uh, that happened between white supremacist group and um, those who were there to march um, in peace. I wonder what we would say to our Jewish brothers and sisters right now. I wonder what we would say to our Muslim brothers and sisters right now or our immigrant brothers and sisters or uh, our Hispanic and Latino brothers and sisters. I wonder what we would say to our black brothers and sisters. I wonder what we would say to our sisters. And I think the only thing there is for us to say is this. We're scared too. And we will not let anything happen to you. It's more than just about saying it's wrong. It's also being able to stand up for what is right and more importantly stand up for whom those people for whom this can be a dangerous time. To not do that is to, what is to do what Isaiah said, which is to come here in vain. Now I'll talk about the gospel a little bit. Um, Jesus is, is going into an area, um, Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon were known as um, places of extravagant wealth. Um, and he met, he meets, um, he, he spoke out about Tyre and Sidon um, back in the 11th chapter of, of Matthew. Because um, I remember everything that's in the Gospels. This just came to me as I was reading that. Actually, in my Bible, there are footnotes, and I tend to read them. Um, so he spoke, he's spoken out against Tyre and Sidon uh, at, several chapters later. But he goes there in defiance. Um, of what his disciples have told him to do. Stay away from that area. They don't want to hear you there. And so Jesus says, maybe I should go there then. So he goes to Tyre and Sidon, and he meets a Canaanite woman. Now, it's, it's, it's interesting. We should pay attention to the words that are used in the Gospels. Do you all remember the Canaanites? Do you remember the Canaanites from the Old Testament? 
Who were the Canaanites? The Canaanites were the people that the Israelites were supposed to conquer and drive out of the land. So the Canaanites have been the long, traditional, historical enemies of Israel. So there's this Canaanite woman who has a child who has a demon. Now, I don't know about you, but I know I have three children. They're old now, older now. Um, I mean, you guys are old. They're, they're 20s. So anyway, um, so 24, 21, and 18 are my, are my children. This, this, this lady has a young, a, a young child. And my child, uh, she says, has a demon. And this causes her to yell out to someone that she knew was her known enemy. And this causes Jesus to hear and have to listen to someone he knew was his known enemy. Now, the disciples are saying, you need to tell her to be quiet and go away. Let me tell you something. Just read that very carefully. Let's tell her to quit shouting and to go away. The voices of those who need healing and need our help will never go away. And this is something I believe that the gospel says Jesus realized in that moment. No matter who they are, no matter who they've been, no matter what our relationship with them has been over time, no matter what we have had ingrained in our minds and in our hearts, there is a need for healing in all people. And so Jesus makes one of the, what I consider, one of the most harsh comments in all of the whole Bible. That is, it's not fair when she asks for help to throw um, the food the children's food, to the dogs. Now, dogs is an interesting term used in the Gospels. It basically meant, um, it, it was a word that was thrown around for everybody who wasn't an Israelite. Um, it was a disparaging term. So, he said, it's not fair to throw the food to the dogs. And she said to him, on her knees, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs from their master's table as if to say, I don't need much. All I need is just a little bit, and I don't even want it for myself. I want it for my child. In the next service, we'll have an 11-year-old read our reading, the one that Karen read. There will be in that service, it's Family Sunday, so there'll be a lot of children there. In that service, there will be children ranging in ages from, from probably four who sometimes comes to probably 13. Most of them will be in that range. And I wonder what they are thinking right now. I wonder if they are scared like many of the adults are in our world. I wonder if they are looking to us to learn how to respond in the face of hatred. And I wonder if we are watching them. I wonder if we're staring into their faces and watching as they worry about their world. I wonder if we look at their faces, will we see a certain bewilderment at the world we all live in? How can all these people hate each other so much? It's almost impossible for a child to do that. They just don't know enough in this world to hate that much. So as they watch us, I wonder and learn from us, I wonder if we might watch and learn from them. Jesus, um, his comments this morning are directed at the Pharisees. Um, his, his comments uh, about their blindness are interesting. Because, um, and I, you know how I like the Greek words, um, uh, the, the words uh, that he used there for, um, for blindness, uh, the Greek word is tuflos. It sounds like floss, but it's just tuflos. Um, and, and, and it actually doesn't just mean blind. It, it means to, to, to be um, covered up in the smoke of self-deceit. In other words, it's kind of a chosen blindness. 
There's another word in there, too, talking about hardness, talking about how the Pharisees had become hard. And the word that's used there is um, poros. What does that sound like? Porous rock, right? Yeah. That's exactly what it means. They've been hardened. Their souls have calloused over, and they become as hard as rock because of self-deceit. And he says that, that unwillingness to see and the commitment to what they think they know is going to be their own downfall. They will lead each other into, his words, the pit. We cannot afford to do that. I feel as though in this world there are all kinds of failures. All of us know about failure. We've been around long enough. But if you want to get really pointed, there is a failure in this country in many places. Notice I didn't say many sides. Many places of leadership. I cannot do that to you. As the priest in your parish, I cannot risk leading all of us into the pit by not saying anything. Since we know that there are ways that we are supposed to act and we know what is right and we know what is wrong in this time we have to choose what is right and more than that we have to speak what is right and to speak on behalf of what our presiding bishop called and what the Bible calls the beloved community if we can't speak into that, if we can't call everybody to unity, if we can't take up for those who need our help, if we can't stand with those who also need our help, if we can't take up for them, if we can't stand with them, what in the hell are we doing here? So I said, and I wasn't really using that just for shock value, uh, Mike Tyson is quoted as saying, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the, his words, mouth. It's interesting. Everybody gets punched. And very few people get up on their own. We can rise in this world. And you can say, I'm just spouting ideological love Buljav, if you want to. But if you believe, and if in your faith you can see a vision of life where the world we live in is not so torn apart, then let's grab each other's hands and stand up in this and claim the beloved community. Anything else, any other reaction is just flat out wrong. May God give us the grace to do what is right. Amen.